Hey, good evening to you uh, and your fa family and friends. Uh, we're just glad to uh, get to share some word again with you tonight. Uh, I'm just going to kind of cut to the chase. Uh, I want to pray with you. And uh, we'll just share some uh, things out of Daniel tonight. Chapter 7, if you're following along in your uh, Wednesday night educational book or if uh, you just want to follow along in your Bible. Uh, it's a little bit of a subject that I... Uh, I, I'm interested in. I wish I could say I were the expert, but uh, certainly not. I just want to share some things that I hope God uh, can reveal to us through, through these scriptures. So if we can, let's just pray together, and then we'll just jump right in. Most gracious Father, we give you thanks for just everything that you are, Lord. It doesn't matter uh, what we need where we are at, how far apart we feel from you, you're just ever present in our times of need. Uh, I know that we've had some tough situations this week. Uh, again, just having family members that uh, we had to say goodbye to and and uh, just the, the cares of this world. There's still people out there that are fighting for their next paycheck and uh, not sure where their provision's going to come from, but God... I've seen this week, I've seen your hand working, and I know that you'll always provide, and you're always there for us. You said that you'll never see the righteous forsaken, or your seed begging, begging for bread, and I just stand on those promises. I ask for your healing touch on those that are affected by this uh, disease and this virus that we're fighting against as a nation, and I ask that you strengthen those workers, the first responders, the uh, medical personnel, those that are in these difficult situations every day. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you strengthen and protect them as they are on the front lines of this issue. I give you praise for it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, last week I uh, shared with you for the first time online, kind of in this format, and uh, I appreciate the response, the comments, the encouragement to me. Uh, for those of you who are able to watch along as we shared that, uh, I hope we can continue doing this and that it's effective uh, while we're not being able to meet on Wednesday nights together. But uh, I just wanted to share again tonight with you, we're continuing uh, in Daniel and we're in chapter 7. So uh, I just want to open up and talk about a little bit about this verse, what it is uh, historically, how it's structured in the book of Daniel. So we saw that in the first couple of uh, chapters, really one through six, those were given more um, kind of told in third person as if someone else was watching it uh, and writing everything down. This verse, uh, excuse me, chapter seven, it changes tones a little bit. And the reason being is because Daniel writes it in the first person. So it starts off, and I'm reading, my eyes will cut away here, I'm reading my iPad, so I hope you'll just follow along with me. I'm in the uh, New Living Translation, and it says, uh, The vision of the four beasts. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his, uh, of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. And then you'll read here where it says, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. So he begins to tell this story uh, the, of, of his dream that, again, it's not really chronological uh, in the sense that this doesn't happen. This dream doesn't occur after the story that we told last week which was where the handwriting appeared, the hand appeared and the writing on the wall uh, spelled out the fall of the kingdom of Babylon. This occurs in the first year of the king Belshazzar, uh, but it's just a dream that God revealed to Daniel uh, for him to kind of understand and, and try to figure out what, what means, what it means and, uh, and interpret it. Uh, so he takes and he takes this information and he writes it down. So just, it's, it's kind of an irony, uh, really, uh, at this time to think about somebody like Daniel, who we know now was a prophet, 
Uh, he, he understood the things that God spoke to him. He was a mouthpiece for God in multiple occasions. But what we see is that he takes the time to not focus on uh, the past, but God's revealing things to him about the future. And it's important to see that he takes the time to write these things down. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but I, I can be one of those guys that always has a story, that always has some throwback message of, of the good old days. And uh, I'm, I'm 40 years old. A lot of my friends right now are all hitting that birthday. You know, right here at the, the first part of 2020, uh, the first, you know, three months now going into April, uh, we're, we're seeing that age that's a kind of a landmark age for us. And so many of my friends are posting things, pictures online, man, remember back when, or uh, one particular post this week was, hey, who was the best uh, high school football player you ever played with? And of course, everybody has a bias towards guys that we played with and against. And, uh, you know, I was able and fortunate to play with a couple of guys who ended up in the National Football League and even won Super Bowls. Uh, uh, so I had that same kind of vision to look back and, and be like, man, that, you know, that was the best, best running back I ever played with was Dominic Rhodes. And I have a tendency to look back. But I'm not always the greatest at stopping and when God speaks to me, looking forward, looking at those things that he has laid out ahead of me. Um, and what I like about what Daniel does is he gives us an example of he hears this dream. And as it says in the first chapter, it said uh, uh, it came to him while he was in his bed. Uh, I don't I don't know what you do, uh, but I often wake up in the middle of the night and I have these these thoughts that I think, oh my gosh, this is the next, uh, you know, million dollar idea, billion dollar idea, and I'll write something down, and then I wake up the next morning and it's something silly, you know, like uh, 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 I, I don't even have a good example right now off the top of my head, but uh, uh, I always think about things, and sometimes I'll wake up and write those things down, and they uh, mean something to me when I come back to in the morning. But uh, I'm not disciplined at that by any means. And so we saw where Daniel in this day was disciplined enough to have some writing utensils, have something to write down. And I'm thankful that he did because we're able to take this vision and see what it means for his people, see what it means for God's people. In verse 3, he says, Four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched until his wings were plucked off, and he was lifted from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. This describes the first animal or the first beast that he sees. So a couple of things about the, what, the way he describes these is, first of all, that when he saw in his vision the night and the four winds of heaven, were coming. Those four winds, uh, that word that he uses to describe wind is a common word that's used throughout the Old Testament of the Bible. And it typically is associated sometimes, it's ruach, R-U-A-C-H, and it's often uh, associated with things like uh, the creation of the earth. Uh, in, the first, um, in the first book of the Bible in Genesis, uh, it talks about that the the spirit uh, blows upon the waters. That word there in the Old Testament is ruach. Okay, it's something that is um, not uh, just necessarily a physical wind, but it kind of represents the stirring and the motion of God. It represents things other than just physically wind blowing out of the east. So when it talks about the four winds, it kind of talks about that the spirit again, in, in another way, was moving upon the waters, if you will. So uh, he says that the four winds were stirring and that four great beasts came out of the sea. Another thing, another uh, uh, visual that, that Daniel uses here is the great sea. Now, uh, we know so many stories about things that occurred uh, in this area, you know, the Mediterranean Sea, if you will, 
uh, this the the great sea that was around uh, the kingdom there in Jerusalem and in Babylon. And what it does is it talks about these things in the sense that usually when they're dealing with the great sea, they're talking about something that is untamable. Um, it's kind of wild. Uh, you look at the story of Jonah uh, when he is on in the boat and it's, they're in the great sea and it's tossing them about. There's so many stories about the, the, the violence of the sea, the, especially the Mediterranean. And so that's what they a lot of Bible scholars refer this to is that it, it has something to do with the great sea and with uh, Daniel's vision being something like what would happen uh, coming up out of the Mediterranean. Okay, so I know I'm, I'm kind of pausing a lot right here, but I'm going to go through the next part uh, pretty quickly. Okay. And so he talks about this uh, lion that uh, had eagle's wings. And I, I love the definitions here because if you, if you stop for just a moment when you're reading the Bible, and this is, I think this is a strong uh, practice for all Christians. What we have to understand when we read the Bible is that we cannot just view it through a context of the way we understand things. We have to understand it in the context in which it was written and the times in which it was written. So while Daniel doesn't spend a great deal of time describing every little detail about this lion, he doesn't discuss what color was the mane of the lion and, and how many cubits or how large the, 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 the lion was. Imagine that he's just trying to disseminate the information that he had in a dream and put that down on paper. What we are accustomed to is we have the liberty of being able to pull up our computer and Google something like a ferocious lion. And all of a sudden, we have a picture of a lion. In fact, one of the activities I saw this week is you can take out your phone, you can Google an image like lion or bear or giraffe or probably snake, and you can click a little button that says view in 3D and you can move your phone around and you'll actually see a, a superimposed figure of a lion standing in your living room. So we don't have to use our imagination in a very great way. Much less do we have to try to take what we watched and then write it down and explain it to other people. I'm the world's worst about watching a movie and then trying to explain to my wife, oh my gosh, there was this scene and, and these, this thing came up out of the water and it was, you know, it was 90 feet tall and, and I just go into this whole shebang about what I saw when really I'm the only person who saw it and she's having to imagine, I'm sure, looked nothing like what I actually saw and is trying to describe. So, again, don't want to be too literal with the interpretation of, of, a, of a lion with this wings. Yes, that's what Daniel explained. But, again, just remember he was terrified by this. He was mesmerized by this. And it bothered him greatly in his sleep. So, um, again, it's not to try to say that it's more or less than what he wrote. But understand that he is just doing his best to, in words that we could all understand, interpret what he saw. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to break down every little detail that he writes down because there are uh, folks that spend so much time uh, in trying to decipher this prophecy. Uh, we do know that we've seen some things that have come true out of this book and, and we can equate it to historical events and see that it is a true uh, representation of a future vision. But what we don't know is exactly what Daniel uh, saw uh, from his own eyes. So I just want to say all that. Uh, I'm probably boring everybody to death at this point. But I just think it's, it's a creative uh, exercise to stop when you read things like this and imagine for yourself what it would be like to try to take something God has shown you and put it down on a simple piece of paper 
uh, or whatever writing utensil that they had available to them at the time. Uh, he goes on to describe uh, another beast in verse 5 that was like the, uh, uh, a bear, and it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth, uh, and he would that the, they said to it, Arise and devour much flesh. This uh, just also corresponds with uh, another kingdom that they represented, that these beasts represent. Uh, this is also a lot like the, the vision that Daniel had interpreted for Nebuchadnezzar of his statue that represented four different kingdoms. And here again we see four kingdoms, a lion with eagle's wings, we see a bear uh, with ribs in his mouth. The third thing, uh, he says, was like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings of a bird. I'm in verse 6. And the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And he says, After I saw the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, and it was devouring breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up from them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of man, with a mouth speaking pompous words. So, again, just a quick recap of these four beasts. They represent four kingdoms. Uh, they all had their a different uh, uh, approach. They all had a different uh, uh, impression on Daniel when they came up out of the water, out of the, the great sea. And um, this one, the last beast that he saw, it kind of specifies that he had eyes like a man, which, you know, again, when God created man, he told Adam that he would give man dominion over all the animals. So for this beast to rise up, but yet to have eyes of man, it was as if it was giving a little bit higher place than all of the other beasts and all of the other animals. Finally, uh, again, I'm not trying to spend a great deal of time in those areas because I, I, I probably could show you some pictures but uh, I don't pretend to be an expert in, in all the details of every uh, character thing that was described, whether it was the, the four sets of wings or uh, the ten horns and the three horns that were plucked out. I, uh, I'm just going to go on to what Daniel actually lays out for us, and that is uh, the interpretation and the continuation of his vision. He says in uh, um, verse 9, he says, I watched till the thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and his hair of his head was pure like wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, and ten thousand, or excuse me, a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. So this is, uh, again, a little different from the first six verses of Daniel because those were considered more of literary uh, storytelling. This is what you would call apocalyptic, and that is that these uh, visions describe very similar things to what we see in Revelation that was written by John the Revelator. So uh, these are, uh, again, it's, it's a very intriguing study. Uh, there's a book called Daniel and Revelation that I have uh, that really tries to draw parallels um, uh, to each one of these things. And it's very, very interesting because I, I believe fully that we are seeing things uh, that we know just according to the Word of God that we knew we would see rise up in the last days. Now, I don't know if that means that uh, tonight when we go to bed, there could be a trumpet sound and we could be called up to meet with him in the air. I, I would hope so. Uh, I, I'm so ready to be with the Lord. But as we said a few weeks ago, uh, many of you who were in our Wednesday night classes heard me say this, but I think it bears repeating is that I think we got to find ourselves in a place where we're ready to see the Lord just because of who he is, not because we're ready to escape this madness that we call 
uh, earth, this this life that we live. You know, I, I get tired of the things of this world. I get I'm tired of seeing all the the negative news and and seeing the families and people being affected by uh, decisions to shut down businesses and and things like that. And I'm also tired of seeing families affected by the sickness and and the the fear and uh, as a friend of mine so aptly put it, you know, the folks that are being uh, uh, affected by this, this coronavirus, they're even in a place where they can't even be with their loved one right at the end because, uh, uh, because of the fear of cross-contamination or exposure. And, you know, I, I looked at, at the date today and I realized that I, at this time last year we were sitting... Uh, in my mom's house, waiting uh, ever so patiently as her body was shutting down. Uh, she was suffering from digestive uh, failure and could not process food, could not uh, take in any nourishment. And so we literally had to sit around for uh, several days as we watched this horrible thing take place. I can not imagine the families. Uh, that are going through the, the the loss or the sickness of a of a loved one, and they're not even able to be there to hold their hand. My heart breaks with for those situations, and and I'm ready as as anybody would be to go and see our Lord, to go be with my Father, and I I wish I had a greater understanding of these uh, uh, messages. But quite frankly, whether you're well versed or you know there's books out there that have been written and I won't name a bunch of names but you guys know you can google apocalyptic preaching and you'll see any number of lists of folks pop up and uh, the thing is is that we just don't know any of us are right until we know that we're right we know that the Lord is going to come uh, but even Jesus says that he does not know the day or hour but it is only known by his father so we don't know exactly what all these four kingdoms represent. We don't even know for sure uh, uh, until we get to heaven what God was exactly speaking through this dream to Daniel. But he does say this thing, and I think it's very uh, uh, powerful. As he sits and he watches the, the Ancient of Days, and uh, because of the pompous words, um, he says that the books were open. Verse 11, he said, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So each one of these beasts faced some type of judgment. And again, every kingdom that has ever come before and from until Jesus comes, every kingdom, including you know, our own great United States of America could face the place where we are broken down, we are humbled before God. Now, where I feel like we're strong today is that we are a country that is allowed to rise up and thank our God. And we're allowed to rise up and give praise to our Father who brings us through these times of trials. And our hope is not in... Uh, bills being signed by Congress that are going to fix all of our financial issues, our hope is in the Lord. And and I'm thankful that we live in a place that is allowed to uh, express that, allowed to see that as our hope and our future, not just what the government could provide. Uh, but I still know that God will judge the kingdoms. Uh, they will all stand before him one day and they will none of them last longer than his kingdom that he establishes. And so uh, the garment being white as snow, we know all these things that were described in the ancients of days, that it was describing the Lord himself as the judge and the, who's seated on the throne. And uh, we know this because of the descriptions of him, uh, the perfection, things like white as snow, white as wool. Uh, it, it, was, it was, again, a description that Daniel was able to understand that just discussed what it would look like. Again, just think about a light that when Moses tried to behold it, he had to only see it uh, as he was passing by, uh, that it couldn't just be revealed to everyone. So uh, that's going to look very white, very perfect. And so Daniel describes that to us. The, the 
the reaction of the the judgment is that he shuts up and he the the little horn with its pompous talk I love that that terminology he shuts up the horn uh, and he he judges it he slays it and was destroyed as for the rest of the beasts they had their dominion taken away yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time so for whatever reason the the ancient of days the Lord here saw fit to not uh, bring down judgment that would end their lives but yet just uh, take away their uh, dominion so he goes on he talks about in verse 13 I was watching in the night visions and behold one like the son of man coming down with the clouds of heaven he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed this is referencing uh, a terminology that we all know now because we've sang so many songs about it but this is referencing Jesus himself um, the the understanding of the New Testament uh, is that we see where Jesus is referred to sometimes as the Son of Man even in the verse, verses uh, before this in Daniel where the story of the three Hebrews being thrown into the furnace they talked about how we we threw in three, pe three people but we see a fourth person who is as the son of man and and we often relate that to being Jesus himself uh, there and so Daniel sees that same type of uh, person and he's given authority he comes alongside and he sits uh, uh, and given the dominion he sits with the ancient of days and I'm here to tell you tonight that that's where our God uh, is today. He's on his throne, uh, seated at his right hand is Jesus Christ, forever making intercession for us in our times of need. So I don't know exactly what all these, these kingdoms mean. I think I've said that uh, ten times. Uh, there are some interpretations and, and some viable uh, explanations. There was a... a an explanation I read and understood about a man named Antiochus uh, who was uh, about two centuries before Christ and he was one of the most despicable uh, people uh, that has ever walked the face of the planet he was a person who attacked Jer uh, Jerusalem on a Sabbath um, he uh, took and he, he tried to dedicate the temple to his God Zeus uh, he killed the men of Jerusalem and he took the wives and children as slaves. Uh, he, he was just, his whole reign was marred in just desolation and abomination towards the things of God. And a lot of scholars believe that when you walk out who that they thought the kingdoms represented, the first kingdom, you know, being Babylon, the second kingdom, the, the bear being the Medio Persian Empire, the third kingdom being uh, the Greek or Roman Empire. Uh, uh, probably misspeaking here. Let me, I could look it up right quick since we're talking about it. Forgive me. So yeah, the, 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 the bear was the Median uh, or the Medio Persian Empire. Uh, the leopard and his four wings represented Persia or uh, the Grecian Empire. Um, and then the Greece or possibly even Rome, just some different interpretations of the iron feet and the clay. The, the person that I mentioned before, Antiochus, uh, it, it was so bad that it sparked um, a uh, revolution, uh, what they call the Maccabean, uh, uh, the Maccabees. And so they, uh, again, I'm not a versed Jewish scholar. We have some friends who could give you way greater information about this, but I can tell you that these people uh, uh, were so divine, devoutly determined to follow their God. Uh, uh, they 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 fought a war over trying to uh, uh, win their right to serve their God back. So um, again, just knowing that God came in, He was put on the throne. All the angels and the hosts and everybody, when court was in session, 
he opened the book and he passed his judgment. Uh, I don't know if this is past tense vision. I don't know if it's uh, something that we could still see come to pass. But I know that God is always going to be seated on his throne. Jesus Christ is always going to be uh, uh, have dominion and authority and giving glory uh, to all peoples and all nations and languages that, that should serve him, uh, as it says in verse 14. And if that takes us to what our golden text is tonight. And that is that uh, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Now I'll tell you, whether or not this king that uh, this kingdom that was destroyed was 167 BC or whether it hasn't happened yet, I still know this. This word is true that his kingdom is an everlasting dominion and it shall not pass away. It is the one which will never be destroyed. Just be thankful tonight, uh, as I talked a minute ago about looking towards the past, that God reveals things to us about the future. I would encourage you, just as an action to take home, write things down. When God speaks to you, write them down. Keep a journal. Uh, it doesn't have to be super religious. You don't have to write down every scripture that you ever thought of, but just take something to go back to because sometimes I believe God will tell us things and then later on, he'll give us the meaning for what those things were. So write the things down. And secondly, know that God is always on his throne. Uh, Jesus has a overcome. He's a conqueror. He's our savior. Uh, there's nothing that's surprising him, uh, and there's nothing that he doesn't have dominion over. Um, I just want to pray again as we close tonight. I, ho I hope that it wasn't uh, uh, this wasn't your bedtime story that put everybody to sleep, but I do hope that next week uh, you'll join us again uh, Wednesday night at uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, we'll be sharing again another vision. You can go ahead and read ahead if you're that kind of kind of person. You can go ahead and read. It's just Daniel chapter 8. And I'm going to endeavor just to discuss and find something there uh, of what God's speaking to us. So I just want to pray with you again. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that I have access to it. I thank you that uh, you're revealing it in a new way every time I read it. God, there's somebody that's watching this tonight that they're reading this scripture and they've they've read it, they've read this story, but maybe something else came out tonight, Lord. Maybe your your truth was revealed in a new and fresh way. Lord, not changed because your truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but God revealed new and afresh. Lord God, uncovered and made uh, uh, life and made Rhema unto our, our, our person. I just give you praise for it. I'm anxious to be with all these people again, but God, I know you have your hand upon each and every one of their lives, and I give you praise for that in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I just want to make one more quick announcement, uh, uh, if you're joining with us tonight. Uh, normally, on the first Sunday of the month, we have communion, and uh, we always love to share this uh, uh, doctrine and disciples of, of the disciples uh, they shared, and we read in Luke chapter 22, uh, where they sit down and break bread, and Jesus tells them uh, what it represents, and it's the last meal that he eats with them. So we don't want to lose the sight of that, even though we're not going to be gathering together. So this Sunday, and we will have more announcements about the times and everything, um, but this Sunday, we are going to be uh, having communion available to you if you want to come by the church uh, Sunday morning and we will have a drive through set up. Uh, we'll be using all the precautions that we, we feel are necessary. Uh, we have uh, sealed uh, communion servings uh, that we would like to distribute for you and your family. Uh, and we want to do that. We want to pray with you uh, as we receive the Lord's Supper uh, uh, and, and just partake in that tradition 
together because we, we don't just do it out of uh, legalism or anything, but of what it represents, and that's the blood and the body of Christ. Pastor's going to be coming to you uh, to talk a little bit more about this, but I just wanted to put that in your mind. Uh, we will be having a, a drive-through communion on Sunday morning, and so we'll get you some more details as soon as we have everything ironed out. Okay, uh, love you guys. Praying for all of you. Uh, once again, please comment uh, on the post. We want to know that these are reaching folks. If you're having a chance to watch, if it's just to tell me that uh, I need a haircut or uh, a better light or something, that's fine. I can take it. Uh, but what I want to do is know that we are connecting with you. Share the post, uh, uh, comment on it, and uh, we hope to talk to you again very soon. Uh, God bless you.